This section is called A Decade of Wasted Cores, named after the paper that uh, this, this section talks about. Uh, the paper itself is linked in the lecture notes uh, and is an interesting read if you are so inclined. Um, but this is based on a 2016 uh, research paper that was published exposing serious scheduling problems, and, and they really did go for a dramatic title by saying A Decade of Wasted Cores. Um, and the authors found in this paper four significant bugs uh, in multi-core scheduling, such that there were threads waiting to run even when cores were sitting idle. Okay, uh, that's not good, but how bad is it really? Well, uh, according to what they show in the paper, the performance degradation varies depending on you know, what uh, the exact problem is, um, but uh, it could be as much as uh, 138 times in, in the worst case scenario, um, but performance degradation is more typically 13 to 24 percent. Okay, even if the you know, 138 times is you know, a corner case that's very rare, the, the 13 to 24 percent is a lot. Right, that's uh, you know performance left on the table. Right? Things we could have been getting and were not. So let's find up. Let's find out what's up with that. Hmm? So there are four different problems, all of which result in the same behavior. Right, um, cores are left idle, although runnable threads are waiting to execute. Now, I mean, we're not like insane bosses who are like freaked out about, you know, workers having five minutes uh, of, of rest, right? Uh, because there's no customers in the shop right now. Um, so if it's, if it's really brief, then it's not a problem, right? Um, if, if a core is left idle for a short period of time, yes, that can happen. You know, sometimes it just takes time for the next thing to be ready. Um, and we should recognize also that dealing with that situation takes effort, right? Uh, if it goes on for a long time, it's more of an issue. If there are four CPUs, each of which is busy, uh, and one thread is waiting in the queue for CPU zero, if the thread in, in CPU three terminates, uh, it may take a moment before the thread that's waiting from CPU zero to move to CPU three, but it's not for free, right? It takes some effort on the part of the scheduler. We have to notice the situation, decide to do something about it, um, and actually carry out the move, and maybe it results in some more cache misses. If the thread is waiting for a very short time, that's probably not worth it, right? It can just wait, you know, what's another second or two, um, or millisecond or two, I guess I should say, um, then it's not a problem. But if the thread is waiting an unreasonably long time, then that's a problem. Right, we don't we don't want that to continue. So, recall we just uh, discussed the completely fair scheduler. So hopefully uh, you you've got that fresh in your mind um, when we talk about this. Uh, but the the completely fair scheduler um, has uh, multiple run queues, one for each core. Uh, and if we take a very simple um, simple example where we have two cores for which we need to schedule. Um, if CPU 0 has one low priority thread uh, and CPU 1 has three high priority threads, that's not going the way it should go. We should actually be redistributing the high priority threads so that things not only are balanced, but that priority is respected, right? Um, if we don't do this, the high priority threads are running less somehow than the low priority threads, which is the opposite of what we want. So Linux is going to periodically try to keep the queues balanced. And load balancing is a do what you must kind of situation. Um, it can be expensive, um, so it can run periodically, but it's not something you would want to do all the time. Um, a completely idle core does trigger immediate load balancing. That's okay, right? It's a problem we need to do something about it. Um, and if a CPU core is currently idle, well, you know, it's not bad for that CPU core to do load balancing so it has more work to do, right? It, the work is going to get redistributed uh, and we're not interrupting an already running task on that CPU because, well, it's idle right now. So yeah, of course we need to give it something to do. Load balancing is, you know, in the absolute simplest approach, and this is um, what people sometimes do in a, an EC459 assignment that's based around load balancing, is we just take tasks from the busiest core 
and we assign them to the least busy one, you know, ideally the one that has nothing, if there's one that has nothing, but we, we reassign them, right? That oversimplifies the actual solution because it makes no accommodation for um, cache locality, non-uniform memory access, uh, any of those things that we've talked about as sort of advanced considerations to maximize performance. So above the level of each core is a larger unit, which is referred to as a scheduling domain. Um, and scheduling domains are grouped. These are logical groupings of the hardware, um, but they are based on what actual hardware is shared in common between them, right? So if they have level two cache in common, we would consider them to be in a group. Um, and then there's a larger group where say, this is the, um, the CPUs that have, um, CPUs that have a level three cache in common and then overall there's here's everything in the system in total right this gives kind of a, a high level overview uh, and it helps the scheduler to make decisions about what to do and where to move things because if we're moving say between you know, things in the scheduling domain that share a level two cache that's less painful than moving things that share nothing so in this image, we have a few different levels, right? Um, three groups are reachable immediately from the first core, CPU zero, shown in the top left of the diagram, in one hop, uh, and the rest in two hops. So the scheduler will try to avoid duplicating work by making sure that one core is responsible for load balancing within that scheduled domain. Um, this is the lowest numbered core that is idle if one exists, uh, otherwise it's the lowest number overall if all of them are busy. Um, and the only way that a core that's not doing something can have some work to do is if it gets woken up. Um, so if a core is busy and it notices there's a lazy one that's sleeping nearby, it will wake it up to send it uh, to do the load balancing. Okay, so there's four bugs that cause the problem that we've observed uh, in, this, uh, in this system. They are, in order, the group imbalance bug, scheduling group construction bug, overload on wake up bug, and the missing scheduling domains bug. Okay, so let's take a minute to talk about each of those and, and see why it's a problem. So the group imbalance bug. Cores would steal work from other cores if the average load of the victim scheduling group, the one from which the tasks come, is higher than the average load of the scheduling group doing the stealing. But averages can be misleading, right? If three of the four CPUs there are uh, maxed out uh, and one of them is idle, uh, whereas you know, over here all of the CPU cores um, are at um, 80%, yeah, the average is misleading in this case, right? Um, we shouldn't um, be stealing work uh, in this case from another group. We should be redistributing work in our own group. Um, or alternatively, if it's the other way around, we might end up stealing tasks um, from a group that has an idle CPU. So we don't want that. Um, so averages are misleading. Um, the fix instead is to use the minimum load of the group, which is to say the load of the least loaded core in the group. Um, and this means that cores will steal more often, um, but we prefer that to leaving them idle. It might mean there's some unnecessary stealing and some like extra work is done and some extra cache misses occur as a result of that, but that's still better than just leaving them idle because yeah, it results in a net performance increase. Um, in the paper, the uh, authors show this can, can result in a 13% decrease in the runtime of make. Um, of course, you know, your mileage will vary. Um, there's going to be different uh, behavior depending on the uh, actual thing that make is making. Um, but to give some idea of the potential speed up, there's that. The next problem is scheduling group construction. Um, and the task set command in Linux is used to pin applications to specific cores, that is configure processor affinity. If groups are two hops apart, load balancing might not steal them um, because, well, we expect that there's not enough stuff in common, right? You know, there's no level three cache or level two cache in common, so we think uh, it's not worth it to steal it. The problem is in this, uh, in this bug that all groups are constructed from the perspective of core zero. So that's a little bit like saying um, if you looked on Google Maps and Google Maps told you the distances to places you wanted to go, but it always used your home address as the starting point. 
that might be fine uh, if you're actually at home. But if you're not at home right now, like uh, you're at the university uh, and you want to get directions to the supermarket or whatever, getting the, you know, the distance from home to the supermarket is probably different uh, from the distance from the university to the supermarket. And you might make a wrong decision based on that. Like, oh, you know, it's only 500 meters away um, when in actuality it's like two and a half kilometers away. So if load balancing was running on core 31, it might not steal from a neighbor like core 29 because it thinks it's too far away because core 29 is two hops away from core zero. Oops. Third bug, overload on wake up. Um, and uh, we already discussed processor affinity and this is an example where uh, too much affinity is a bit of a problem. If a thread goes to sleep on group one and it gets unblocked later by another thread, we try to put it back where it was. That's not always what we want. Sometimes what we want is to assign it to say uh, a group where there are available cores, right? Even if other groups are not busy, it reduces the number of, of cache misses, but it means sometimes a thread gets in a queue that's busy rather than one that's free. This is a little bit like if you're at the supermarket and you know, you're in the checkout line and you realize, oh no, I forgot bananas, uh, and you go back and you get bananas, then you insist on getting into the same line, even if one of the other cashiers has nobody in line. Right? Not great. Um, doesn't doesn't really do what we want. Um, that's not ideal. It would reduce the number of cash misses for sure, but um, why would you enter a queue that's busy instead of one that's free? Uh, and then finally, um, there was one more bug that appears to have been caused by an error during refactoring. Um, when a core was removed and re-added, some function was no longer uh, invoked. Um, this I think is somewhat rare in a typical operating system scenario that we talk about because we don't uh, you know, have cores joining and leaving the party very often, um, but it was an issue in uh, some of the uh, systems that it was being tested. Uh, and this would cause all of the uh, threads in an application to run on a single core, even though other threads were idle, uh, other cores were idle at the time. All of this is to say that in conclusion, scheduling is by no means a solved problem, right? We've talked about many different scheduling algorithms and they range from very simple to quite complicated. And um, as time goes on, you know, the hardware that we're working with changes and our limiting factors change. Uh, and so there is continuously ongoing changes to how the scheduling algorithm works in the expectation that we can get better and better behavior uh, and adapt to things. Now, the simple scheduling algorithm that worked well in a single core environment doesn't work as well in a multi-core world. Um, scheduling algorithm that was intended for you know, a time sharing you know, batch job system isn't necessarily a good match for the desktop. Um, and other fun lessons that um, will hopefully stick with you uh, around you know, other kinds of problems and not just scheduling is number one, averages can be misleading. Uh, and number two, optimization sometimes do more harm than good. So we have to be careful and check our assumptions. So that's really it in terms of scheduling as a topic. Um, there is a bit of a transition. Uh, we're gonna talk about IO devices for a bit and then we're gonna talk about scheduling for IO devices uh, just to make sure that we've got all that covered. Um, but this ends the scheduling topic for real uh, as we enter into the last major topic of the course where we talk about uh, input and output devices.